Right. Uh, <clears throat> let, let us have some more discussion on the, on the amendment. I, uh, Cynthia uh, Farina asked to be recognized and, and Carl Mallon. But let me, Cynthia, why don't you identify yourself, please? Thank you. I'm Cynthia Farina. I'm a public member. Um, and I seconded uh, Peter's amendment, proposed amendment. Um, I would like to see this much stronger. Uh, and I hope that uh, the conference, in any event, considers this only a first step. Um, what I wanted to speak to um, was the whole issue of uh, how this plays into open government and uh, accessibility of information on the Internet. Um, that's an area I've been working in for a few years, looking at the Bush administration's um, advances, looking at the Obama administration's advances. And I've become increasingly convinced that although all parts of the regulatory spectrum benefit from easier access to, to information, and that's certainly what the Internet can give us, that the principal beneficiaries of this development are small businesses, small local state and local governments, NGOs, and individuals. To the extent that the Internet can make information easier to get to, easier to understand the meaning of, and easier to understand the significance for that individual or group of the information, then that lowers the cost of participating in rulemaking and of understanding their regulatory rights and responsibilities. And I don't think we can overestimate how much greater those costs are for these small entities and individuals than for um, large corporations, trade and professional organizations, and things like that. So, as I say, increasingly, my expectation is that if the open government movement is successful, it will bring these sectors of the stakeholder community or, spe or spectrum um, into more active and informed participation. There's a lot of reasons why that's a good thing from the perspective of the government, from the perspective of those organizations themselves. But any imposition of cost, unless it is graduated, I think directly undermines what open government um, can accomplish for us. And so um, I, as I said, I wish this language were stronger. Um, I hope it's the first step. Uh, for the, uh, you know, for ACUS, um, because until we address the issue of fees, uh, we really are not just sort of um, bucking the tide of information wanting to be free. I think actually we are undermining what we're trying to do with the Open Government Initiative. Thank you. Um, Carl Malama, a public member. Um, hi, Carl Malaman. I'm a public member. Um, I want to thank Mr. Cooney and Ms. Bremer. I think the study is good, and it's the first time that, that this issue really has been um, looked at. And I think there are some important benefits to incorporation by reference um, of, of tapping into the expertise of the private sector. But those are, in a sense, secondary benefits. Um, there's some primary considerations, um, which I think we can't forget about equal protection under the law and due process under the law. And those are, are not empty words. And when we charge for access to the law, we're imposing a poll tax on access to justice and access to the law. Um, it's not, um, I, I've heard often that this is not an issue, that those that need access to the law have access. Uh, but I've talked to a lot of small businessmen and government lawyers who have a real problem when they have to pay $60 or $100 simply to read, um, to read a proposed regulation or, or an actual regulation. Um, I think without the Strauss Amendment, we're not going to meet that minimum floor of trying to make access to these regulations um, available to the public. And I guess I would like to remind the conference of Justice Breyer's closing comments when he was here last time. Um, he said that uh, a law that is um, not public is not a law. And I think without the Strauss Amendment, this recommendation doesn't meet that minimum threshold. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Jim Tozzi, public member. Oh, thank you. I'm Jim Tozzi. 
uh, I'm a public member and I'm also a member of the committee that had jurisdiction over this, this, this issue. Uh, my view is uh, I rise in opposition to the gentleman from New York's amendment. And uh, my views are, are somewhat easy to state because the gentleman from New York's move, his amendment, moves one of the most basic items and concerns that our committee had. And our committee stated the following in our recommendation, and this provision would be deleted uh, by Professor Strauss's amendment. And the point that I'm raising is the following, it's item four, it says, in deciding whether to incorporate a particularly copyrighted material by reference, the cost to the regulated and other interested parties to obtain a copy of the material should be considered. So the effect of Professor Strauss's amendment is to delete any concern about cost. Now, my uh, concern is somewhat a result of our own work experience. My work experience when I was in the government that there has been were a number of five and eventually eight consecutive administrations in asked and required that any rulemaking activity consider cost and to alleviate and to remove cost from any of those considerations is counter to the actions taken by eight presidential eight administrations in rulemaking. To delete the amendment at this time is even a, a, a greater problem because the record is clear that the committee recommended cost and that ACUS took it out. Now, I don't pretend to have a monopoly on work experience. Professor Strauss was the general counsel of a major agency and he, he has experience a different than I. Furthermore, if you look at scholarly articles and you keep score, it's Strauss 144, Tozy 1. <laughs> but notwithstanding these impeccable credentials of the gentleman from New York, I was moved that, uh, and I strongly recommend that the Assembly not adopt uh, the amendment. Thank you. Um, let's see. I'm going to call on Amy Bunk, I believe that is back there. It is. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Amy Bunk. I run the legal unit at the Office of the Federal Register. Um, I would like to specifically address recommendation, the um, Professor Strauss's recommendation number four. Uh, to give you a little background on the legal staff at the Office of the Federal Register, there are three of us. Um, we review all requests for incorporation by reference that are submitted by agencies. We also uh, review questions that the scheduling unit has about documents that are submitted for publication and any other legal issue that comes up. Um, I think um, Mr. Cooney said it best when he was talking about in his uh, response to um, the proposed recommendation for that the Office of the Federal Register is probably not in a good position to evaluate the degree in which public disclosure is needed to achieve agency policy or to subject, uh, subject the effectiveness of the agency program to public scrutiny. Um, in, in addition to that, uh, if we started tracking NPRMs that contain uh, in, incorporation by reference requests, um, I, I think it would just add a lot, a great deal of time to the IBR approval process, several months possibly. And um, I think um, we do try to set some basic standards for accessibility. Um, you know, we're w willing to look at uh, ways to improve that. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the subject matter expertise in, and I just, don't have probably the staff to do a lot about it at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, Jonathan Rose had it. Jonathan Rose, public member. Uh, I support Peter Strauss's amendment, even though I can't vote, and a number of the comments made in support of it, and would only add this. It seems to me that those eight, those private standard-making organizations who, who don't want to release their copyrights uh, when these things are incorporated, when the standards are incorporated by reference, 
in my view, sort of want to have their cake and eat it. Uh, they want their standards to control, and by incorporating them by reference, they gain that. Uh, it seems to me to them not be willing to have them available at no cost to those who might be affected by them uh, does not, uh, in my view, seem totally consistent. Uh, I think they not only benefit by them, by having them adopted, they reduce certain kinds of risks that arise in the standard making process. Uh, standards can be very anti-competitive, and there have been antitrust litigation over the adoption of standards and the exclusion of certain uh, kinds of materials that don't meet those standards. The railroads learned a long time ago that the best way to avoid these kind of problems is to have an agency do your work for you. They can enforce the standards better than a private organization, and you certainly mitigate the antitrust problems. I think, therefore, there are numerous benefits to those organizations who want their regulations to be incorporated by reference, and therefore, I think it's not quite appropriate that they resist in letting them be available without charge. Thank you. Oh, okay, so here's we're coming up on 60 minutes. Let me let, uh, and then we, we should have a vote, but let me uh, let Peter respond and then John Cooney have uh, for the committee the last well, one. Very briefly, uh, much as I admire Jim Tazi, I think he hasn't given um, the way in which I attempted to leave resolution of this issue out sufficient credit. Again and again, it talks about reasonable electronic access, reasonably accessible electronic versions. And my notion was, is, that to the extent costs are in fact exported, what those costs are will be part of the determination of what's reasonable. Um, if, a, uh, if a standard setter is willing to make the standards available on a read-only basis during the comment period for free, that too could be a consideration if it comes at a later point for payment. What, what I'm trying to do is avoid the necessity of saying affirmatively it's okay to charge. Um, and, and finally, uh, there's nothing in here about a responsibility for the Office of Federal Register for NPRMs. Um, all that item four attempts to do is to direct the Office of Federal Register to recast its definition of reasonable availability in light of the electronic age, which it has not done and it ought to do. Uh, John, you want to make a final comment, then we'll go for a vote on the amendment. <laughs> uh, a few very quick points here. Um, we're not here on an advocacy function. We're here as ACUS, where our statutory mission is to balance fairness and efficiency. Um, I, I don't think that we ought to just eliminate the consideration of cost. That's one of the critical factors that's involved here. Um, its existence can't be denied. It's been a central part of the process. And so I think it's important the, the, the balancing process that we're required to go through to explicitly lay out what the factors are that were being accommodated, that are being balanced. Um, and with respect to Cynthia's comments, um, you know, w I understand where the advocates would like to go, but I don't think ACUS can get people there. What we can do is that we can establish a baseline. The people who are advocating for greater openness and fairness will be a lot better off tomorrow morning if this recommendation is adopted as proposed because they can use this as the platform, the baseline, on which they're going to make other um, advocacy efforts. If ACUS has identified this problem and brought it to the world's attention that there's an anomaly here, you're going to be a lot better off when you can put, you don't have to, you can put the words in our mouths. You don't have to state them yourselves. You can say that a federal agency has recognized this concern after con discussion extensively with the other agencies. And finally, I'd like to refer to what Emily said. We're really just at the beginning of this process. 
We don't know if there are real problems here because the agencies are just in the initial stages of finding out that collectively they have a problem and learning from each other what techniques have been used so far. I don't know if there will be an impasse. I can't predict if there are technological solutions that may provide a silver bullet for this problem or that may get us well down the line. Um, I think that it's advisable to let the process play out to see if we can push the agencies to try to become aggressive. Um, already the standard setting bodies are beginning to respond to this. Um, it, I am told that at the most recent ANSI colloquium, um, a member of one of the large standard setting bodies stood up and started discussing how his group used um, the, uh, the read-only um, process at the NPRM stage. I think it's very early, and I think that ACUS has already can declare success on this because we've pushed the process forward and we haven't even had a vote on the First Amendment yet. So for those reasons, I recommend that the, um, um, that the recommendation be passed as proposed. I think we're on to something solid here and something that we're going to look back later on and say, you know, Carl um, and his people um, were very good at uh, – um, calling this to people's attention. ACUS grabbed attention, thanks to the chairman, and developed it further, and we're at the first stage because we're going to shine a light on an issue that's important and anomalous. Thank you. Thank all of you. Um, so let us vote now on the Strauss Amendment presented by Harder, um, and you know what it is. All in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. 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 I think it's the nays have it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so now we are back to the motion on the uh, proposal, the recommendation as proposed. Uh, are there any further comments before we vote on the overall proposition? Uh, yes. Uh, Steve, wait a second. Sorry, Steve Burns, a government member. I, I just like a. Uh, uh, sort of a, a brief explanation for Recommendation 11, what you're trying to get at there in terms of a, a legislation to allow this procedure for, I guess, for petitions for rulemaking, which I know my agency already uses and, in fact, wouldn't wait for changes to, for a, to incorporate by reference changes to a standard. So I'm trying to – are you trying to fix something that may be a peculiarity for some agencies? or difficulty for some agencies? Um, I, I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, the answer is, is basically yes. Um, I found that there are some agencies that, for, for a variety of reasons, have a harder time updating their regulations that incorporate by reference. It's a particular problem for the hybrid agencies, such as OSHA, who are subject to procedural requirements that exceed those that are in 553, and so they can't use direct final rulemaking. Um, and even for agencies that that can use direct final rulemaking, it's really only useful if it's an absolutely uncontroversial change. Because a, a single adverse comment derails you and sends you back to the beginning of a notice proposed uh, uh, at the NPRM stage. So, you know, where where all that's happening is that, you know, we're moving from the 2001 version to the 2008 version, and it's, you know, it reflects superior technical information but doesn't change the, the regulatory purpose of incorporation. Uh, we think that a, a streamlined process would be, would be a benefit. Um, so that's why. Okay. Uh, one more. I guess the question I have is, is whether this procedure in 11 is limited to the technical standards as defined by OMB or somewhere else you ha also have is some degree of balance that it's not non-controversial. Because if they're regulatory standards, I'm troubled by, by C2. If they're technical standards, I probably am not. So, I mean, I think that I, I would suggest and I don't have a magic language on it. I think that needs clarifying. We're pretty much in all cases talking about technical standards. Uh, the distinction that, that Professor Strauss draws is, is, is accurate, and I understand that. And, in fact, we have a, a recommendation in the drafting section um, that, that addresses this. The second sentence of Recommendation 5 says that incorporated material may provide detail, but a regulation should, by itself, make the basic concept of the rule understandable without the need for the reader to refer to the incorporated material. And this is explicitly tied to the, the part of OMB Circular that, that Professor Strauss identified. Uh, when you're incorporating by reference, it is to fill in technical detail. It is not to 
adopt a regulatory standard by reference. The regulatory standard needs to be in the regulation, and the incorporated material needs to only provide technical detail. Okay. Um, shall we vote now on the uh, recommendation as presented by, by the committee and the council? Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Eyes have it. Um, so now you've done so well, you can have a coffee break. Uh, <laughs> and we'll come back, and let's try and get back here in 15 minutes, uh, back in business. That Good job. <laughs>